makes the locals type of reports and you don't type of reports.
guess you're right.
certainly this court recalls the attorney-client privilege issue where Mr. Meyer, who represents Mr. Wagner, appeared after the trial motion to quash the subpoena that Mr. Parker had issued and Mr. Nash had issued for those materials, did appear and did provide to the court that not only did Jake not waive his attorney-client privilege, but that he had had a discussion with him and that Jake specifically was not waiving his attorney-client privilege. So while Brunson did come out after this case was decided by the jury, it is pertinent in that it involves the same topic. It is not relevant given the fact that this court found that Jake had not, in fact, waived his attorney-client privilege and therefore Brunson did not require a different result on behalf of the court, Your Honor. Under the logic that the defense is putting forth, in fact, if George Wagner testified about the subject of the homicide and waived his attorney-client privilege as well, that's simply not the case. Jake has had to have consented and knowingly and voluntarily waived that privilege and or testified about the substance of those facts. Additionally, Your Honor, in regards to the staff specifications, as this court knows, this case was indicted in November of 2018. All four individuals involved in these homicides were indicted. We have 22 counts. Jake actually had 23 counts for having unlawful sexual conduct with a minor regarding Hannah Brodin. But they all were indicted with the death specifications. And the state absolutely had a legitimate position on that and had every intention of bringing full force of those death penalty specifications to the extent that they were able to. In regards to the not dismissing the death specifications prior to the start of this trial, we were happy to do so and we offered on more than one occasion to do so if the defendant was willing to waive any double jeopardy or speedy trial arguments as to the specification, as in fact Jake Wagner did, in order that we could proceed in a more ordinary, just as an aggravated murder trial with the understanding that we could bring the specifications if in fact Jake did not get here and had his own agenda as far as. So that opportunity was available to the defense. And so if anything, we would kind of consider this as invited here. But also, Your Honor, we did cite some cases that say that there is no reason to believe that just because a jury is death qualified that they are more conviction prone, nor does it mean they're not a fair cross-section of the community. This court did a very excellent job during the one-year process with the individual one-year and hardships. And then, of course, the death penalty was there of really fleshing out any issue that the jury had and making sure that they were a fair cross-section and that they did not continue to get sick, et cetera. So because both of these issues have been fully litigated and nothing that the defense has provided by the way of new case law or the affidavit of Mr. Nash requires the court to do anything to find anything else other than what he did during trial. Therefore, we would request that the judge be denied the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Something happened to my hard line. Is there any way you could set this right? You set that little speaker there. The court has considered the memorandum filed by each side and the relevant oral arguments in the court will find that the motion for new trial is not well taken and will deny the motion for new trial. One matter that we need to take up before moving on to the sentencing hearing is the matter of the highest violent offender database. The court is required by law to inform the defendant of certain things concerning that. Mr. Wagner, you've been convicted of or have been found guilty by jury of eight counts of aggravated murder. That classifies you as a violent offender and it's presumed that you will be required to enroll in the violent offender database with respect to those offenses that classify you as a violent offender and that you have all of the violent offender database duties with respect to that offense. Now, the court has considered the memorandum filed by each side and the relevant oral arguments in the court will find that the court has considered the memorandum filed by each side and the relevant oral arguments in the court will find that the court has considered the memorandum filed by each
to that offense for 10 years after you initially enroll in the database. The court has provided uh, you, uh, through your attorneys here, with a copy of the form that advises you of uh, those duties. Did you have an opportunity to look at that form? Yes, sir. And did you go over it with your attorneys? Yes. And did, did you read it yourself? Yes. You feel that you understand it? Yes. Um, the presumption that you enroll in the uh, violent offender database is a rebuttable presumption. Uh, you have the right uh, to file a motion to rebut the presumption, asserting in your motion that you were not the principal offender in the commission of the offense offenses that classify you as a violent offender and requesting that the court not require you to enroll in the violent offender database and that you not have all of the uh, violent offender database duties with respect to the offense offenses in this case. Uh, that motion must be filed uh, prior to the time of sentencing. I don't know if it's your intent to do that to you this morning or not, but uh, if you file the motion, a hearing will be held and you will have the burden of proving to the court by a preponderance of the evidence that you are not the principal offender in the commission of the offenses that classify you as a violent offender. If you satisfy that burden and the court finds by a preponderance of the evidence that you were not the principal offender, then the presumption is rebutted. And in that case, the court will continue the hearing for the purpose of determining whether, notwithstanding the rebuttal of the presumption, you should be required to enroll in the violent offender database and have all violent offender database duties with respect to the offenses that classify you as a violent offender. In making that determination, the court would consider several things. Uh, one, whether you have any uh, convictions for any offense of violence prior to the offenses uh, uh, at issue here, which classifies you as a violent offender, and whether those prior convictions, if any, indicate that you have a propensity for violence. Two, the result of a risk assessment of yourself conducted through use of a single validated risk assessment tool established under Section 5120.114 of the Revised Code. Three, your degree of culpability or involvement in the offense at issue that classifies you as a violent offender. And four, the public interest and safety. If you do not file a motion to attempt to rebut the presumption, or if you file a motion but do not succeed in rebutting the presumption, or if you file a motion and rebut the presumption but the court determines after considering the factors mentioned that notwithstanding the rebuttal of the presumption, you should be required to enroll in the violent offender database and should have all violent offender database duties with respect to the offenses that classify you as a violent offender, then the court shall issue an order specifying that you are required to enroll in the violent offender database and have all of the violent offender database duties with respect to the offenses that classify you as a violent offender. In that case, you will be required to enroll in the violent offense database within 10 days after, and the law provides within 10 days uh, after um, uh, if you are not, uh, within 10 days uh, after sentencing if you're not sentenced to a term of incarceration. In this case, however, a term of incarceration, of course, is mandatory. So in this case, it would be within 10 days after your release from incarceration. And you would be required to comply with all of the duties of the Violent Offender Database for a period of 10 years after you initially enroll in the database and will be uh, provided, in this case, you have been provided with written notice of your duties as an enrollee in the violent offender database, and you would be required to read and sign a form, which you've already done here, uh, indicating that you have received and understand the notice. So I'm not sure whether he intends to file a motion. <coughs> uh, I, I guess we would just have an oral motion and, and point out that uh, you know the state's theory in this case with respect to George was that he was a, that he was 
complicit and not the principal offender. And so, and, and as the court knows from the testimony uh, throughout the case, including his own testimony, he has no prior convictions of any sort, certainly no prior violent uh, offenses. And so, I'm not sure what experience the state has with this particular section, but uh, it's, it's uh, we need to have a hearing on the issue of whether the whether the presumption is rebutted, uh, which the court is prepared to do this morning if uh, if the parties are. And I suppose the hearing could actually be post-sentence as far as that goes. I don't see any prohibition there, but, but uh, we could also have the hearing this morning on that. What's counsel's desire on that? Yeah, as far as the state's concerned, see that in a case the motion must be filed at any time in the sentencing, the defendant be required to, required to enroll. There are four factors in some of these we wouldn't have before us as a result of a risk assessment tool that the two things we would be arguing would be the degree of culpability or involvement in the underlying offense and this is the main one the uh, <clears throat> public interest and safety and i will point out for the court that uh, the qualifying offenses uh, for sierra's law that's what this is about the kind of database offense or aggravated murder, which he's been convicted of, and it also includes any attempt, conspiracy, or complicity conviction for any of those offenses as well. The complicity and uh, <coughs> conspiracy also apply. I'm sorry, apply to? Uh, <coughs> apply to qualifying offenses. Database, yeah. yeah, conspiracy in and of itself, or complicity in and of itself. So I indicated the first eight, eight capture of aggravated murder would apply, but the, the, the conspiracy and the prosecutor point out complicity would also be those that qualify him uh, for this. So the, 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 they're actually anticipated here is a hearing on whether he has rebutted the presumption uh, in, by establishing by a preponderance of the evidence that he's not the principal offender in the commission of the offenses that classify him as a violent offender, and then if the court finds he has done that, then notwithstanding that, whether he should be required to uh, be uh, uh, to enroll. I'm not sure. It I, sounds like maybe the state is, is agreeing that he was not the principal offender. He was. Actually, uh, we would not agree on that, Your Honor. He is. Uh it, can, it talks about conspiracy or complicity as well. Again, there's testimony from Jake Wagner that he, would, that he wasn't a uh, trigger puller on the case, but it still covers uh, conspiracy and complicity as well, too. And again, it's a rebuttable presumption. Uh, we, would, uh, we would argue that specifically, if you look at the factors, yep, if you look at the factors, uh, the most important one being public interest and public safety. You've got somebody who's been convicted of uh, your eight uh, aggravated murders and other uh, other charges involving those. Don't those factors, though, aren't th don't those uh, come in only if he has rebutted the yeah. presumption? Yeah, it's, up to, it's up to him to rebut it. If he wants to try and rebut it, you know, we're here and ready. Well, I, I think we would just adopt the testimony from the trial. I mean, that's a better hearing than any hearing. No. So you're willing to submit this as a part of the hear as as the in the hearing to rebut the presumption, you're submitting the evidence <coughs> produced at trial and don't intend to present anything else. That's right. okay. So so there there now does the state have a response to that? Yeah, we'd be willing to let the court take judicial notice of the facts the facts that were testified to and the evidence in this case. Again, even if he were not uh, arguably a principal offender, he's still convicted of conspiracy and the complicity charge as well. And I would argue most importantly, there again, there's two factors. His degree of culpability or involvement 
and the underlying offenses. And quite frankly, frankly, Your Honor, in plain English, he was up to his eyeballs in this, helped plan it. You heard the testimony of the other two co-conspirators. He was completely involved in it. And I would argue the public interest and public safety, most importantly, and you've got somebody that's been uh, convicted of eight separate aggravated murders and was indicted on the death specs. And hopefully there's never ever a chance that he would ever be out in a position to register, but uh, we just asked the court to take judicial notice of the back of this case. So we wouldn't again, be still argue that the, the conspiracy to publicity apply to he wouldn't be he'd be a principal offender in those. So that's moving on to the second tier of the hearing actually and then uh, from this, is that acceptable with the defense also that we move to that to that second tier of the hearing provided for yes. court will find that the defendant has uh, rebutted the presumption uh, by showing that he was not the principal offender in the commission of the uh, crimes. However, for purposes of this hearing only, the court makes that finding, but the court will also find, uh, based upon his degree of culpability and involvement in the offenses committed for which he's been convicted, the, the ones that that classify him as a violent offender and also in the public interest and safety that notwithstanding that rebuttal uh, that the defendant uh, should be required to enroll in the violent offender database and should have all violent offender database duties with respect to the offense that classifies uh, offenses that classify him as a violent offender and he will be required to enroll in that database within 10 days of his release from incarceration. Those duties are set forth in the form that he has already uh, signed here. All right. That's just not our objection. Right. And now we uh, are, uh, are, are we ready now to proceed with the sentencing hearing itself? Is the state ready? Yes, Your Honor. Is the uh, defense ready? Yes. All right. The state may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, as this court knows, um, the state did submit a sentencing memorandum, which was quite lengthy. Um, in that um, sentencing memorandum, we also provided a sentencing chart um, just for the court's reference because this is numerous counts with lots of specifications, etc. cetera. Um, so I would just ask the court to rely on some of the arguments that the state made during that, in that sentencing memorandum. Um, specifically, and again, I know the court knows this, um, the factors that the court is to look at when determining whether an offense is more serious than others of, of its kind um, and or um, the factors that don't exist to suggest that it's less serious. Additionally, Your Honor, um, factors where you are to determine whether or not the defendant is likely to reoffend or not. Um, in that argument, I did reference, um, even though he does not have convictions, he certainly testified to numerous offenses that he and his family have committed uh, basically um, for more than a, uh, over a decade. Um, so again, Your Honor, I would just ask the court to rely on the arguments that the state made in the sentencing memorandum. Additionally, Your Honor, um, the one factor that I'm going to ask the court to focus on the most today is the impact on the victims and the seriousness of the offense. As this court knows, the overriding um, the state or the court is supposed to impose a sentence that is consistent with the overriding um, principles of the sentencing statute, um, specifically that you not, that the sentence not demean the seriousness of the offense or the impact um, to the victims. Um, frankly, Your Honor, this is a day um, that many of us in this room thought would never come. It has been six and a half long years since this family behind me um, learned that the gruesome fate of their loved ones, the crime seemed so brutal and so nonsensical then, they still do, even after, or perhaps especially after learning what we already knew to be true. That is, that none of these victims deserve to die. None of them did anything to warrant the death sentences they received at the hands of the defendant and his family. Today, I urge the court to focus specifically and mainly on that impact to the families when fashioning a sentence in this case. Um, in this case, you have 
both the seriousness and uh, the seriousness of the offenses and the impact on the victims. I can't imagine a more serious offense. It has been said far and often that this is one of the most serious aggravated murders in the state of Ohio. Not that any murder, of course, comes without pain and horror for those killed and those left behind, but the killing of eight people in such a premeditated fashion for literally no reason and all in one night, I would suggest does make this one of the most serious aggravated mur murder cases Ohio has seen. I think even the defendant has agreed that there are few crimes we have encountered that are, have more premeditation than, than this case does. Um, there were four months of, of admitted premeditation in this case. I'd also like to just briefly um, discuss the complicity um, posture. As this court knows, the state did try the defendant under both um, as a principal offender for some of the offenses, but certainly as a complicitor in the others. As this court knows, the, the defendant is permitted to be punished just the same as if he were the principal offender as to any of these offenses. Um, and as this court also knows, one of the death penalty specifications that was dismissed says right in the language of the specification itself that if the defendant was not the principal offender, if the offense was premeditated, then that specification would apply. So, so I would just kind of bring that uh, to the court's attention. Even if um, he was a complicit in some of these offenses, um, the law provides that he could have received the death penalty had the state not dismissed the death specs in this case. Um, Your Honor, in a moment, the court you will hear from some of the family members of those who were killed in this case. Not all, but some. Some, as I noticed in our sentencing memorandum, are no longer with us. Both Gary and Dana's fathers have died since learning of their children's passing. Both mourned and grieved their losses until their dying day. Both wanted more than anything, not only to see them again, but to also see justice in this case. I would submit to the court that the impact to the victim should be paramount. They are at long last and for the first time able to address the court and provide this impact information. Up to this point, they have had to remain restrained and quiet. In fact, that was even the subject of a court order. Despite having to sit in the same room as people they know killed their loved ones, despite seeing and hearing the graphic details and image of what this defendant and his family did. Today, finally, their voices will be heard. I have read over some of their statements, and I assure you I cannot say anything more powerful or meaningful than what they have written. You will hear from brothers and mothers and daughters and sons, including the now nine-year-old son of Frankie Boone, through his mother. I ask the court to hear the words and strongly consider the impact this has had and will continue to have on not just the lives of those who were slaughtered in their own homes, most in their own beds, but of every single person who deserves to have these people in their lives, their children, their parents and siblings and cousins, all of whom they loved. These were people that were killed that night, people who lived and laughed and loved and who deserved to continue to live and laugh and love. You've now heard from three of the four people responsible for these crimes. You know how cold and calculated and depraved these crimes were, how they self-anointed themselves as judge and jury for these eight people, how they led a life of crime and never had any remorse about doing so. In fact, they remained proud of how adept they were at it. But this is not yet another in a series of arsons or trailer heights or any other felony they chronically committed. This is the unjustified, unprovoked, horrible, senseless killing of eight innocent people. He should not get eight for the price of one, even though at some point the state recognizes that after all of the firearm specifications, there's little chance the defendant would ever get out of prison. But in this case, Your Honor, I would submit it is the principle of the thing. The defendant does deserve the death penalty. There is no question, all four of them do, including Angela, who did not even leave the house that night. But because that is no longer on the table any longer, we urge this, the court to impose eight consecutive life without parole sentences regarding the murder of each of these lives, and to impose maximum and consecutive sentences to each of the remaining counts as well, because each and every remaining count in the indictment represents one more step in either the planning, the executing of, or the coming up of these horrific crimes and should be punished as such. The defendant has benefited from his brother's actions. That is the only reason he does not face the death penalty as we speak. He should not benefit even more than he already has for something that he did not contribute. The defendant in his sentencing memorandum begs for mercy. He showed no mercy for the victims who just wanted to live. 
They had no one to beg for their lives or demand due process. He was judge, jury, and executioner in their lives. He deserves no mercy. Your Honor, at this time, um, numerous victims, uh, family members are going to address the court. Um, in a few instances, or in a few instances, Ms. Kerr, our victim advocate on the case, is going to read their statements um, on behalf of them. For one reason or another, a couple of them could not be present. Um, others just didn't think they would be able to complete the sentence. So the first um, victim impact statement is from Angel and Aunt to Hannah Hazel. And Ms. Kerr will read that victim impact statement, Thank you. Hello, my name is Angel, and this statement represents the family, family of Hannah Hazel Gilly. May we please take the time to thank you, Your Honor, for conducting a fair trial. We would also like to thank the jury for performing their civic duties. We know that they sacrificed time that could have been spent with their own families during this trial. We would also like to thank every police officer, detective, every BCI investigator, any person who had a hand in gathering evidence, processing evidence, and following up on every small piece of information given by family members and family friends. Our family would also like to thank Angela Canepa. What can we say about Angela? She listened to our families, heard probably a thousand theories and never wavered in finding the truth. She followed the evidence and was thorough in putting it all together like a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. Angela, our family would like to thank you for the countless hours spent looking over evidence, talking with investigators, and presenting the evidence here. Thanks to you everyone, everyone knows what happened that night in April of 2016. For a while, our family was not sure that we would ever know the truth Thank you for everything, Angela. Hannah Hazel Gilly was born on February 28, 1996. She was the smallest baby born in our family. Hannah was the youngest granddaughter of seven grandchildren. She was raised by her grandparents and lived on a dead end road. Lots of friends and family members live on that road, so she rode the school bus with her cousins and kids who she had known her entire life. Hannah attended Northwest schools. She participated in cheerleading and was a good student. She was loved by everyone who knew her. She was funny and beautiful and would light up a room just by walking into it. She attended Northwest schools and then attended vocational school and graduated with a certificate in child development. She competed in a pageant at our local town yearly festival and was known by nearly everyone in our small community. Hannah soon met the love of her life, Frankie Roden. They had a lot in common. They both liked to ride ATVs, go to demolition derbies, and just hang out and have fun with friends and families. Frankie then proposed to Hannah. She said yes. It wasn't long until she had moved in with him and had a baby on the way. Both families gathered in excitement at the gender reveal. It's a boy. Everyone was happy, a new member of the family. Both families gather again for a baby shower, and then in October 2015, Ruger was born. Everyone visits at the hospital excited about the new baby. Hannah loved being a mother. She was a good mother, and she took great care of her new son. Our family had one more Thanksgiving, one more Christmas, and one more Easter with Hannah and Frankie. And then on that day in April, our lives changed forever. A few days later, we are making arrangements at our local funeral home for our 20-year-old, beautiful, new mother of a six-month-old infant. Why? Our family is in total shock. Why? Why did this happen? I guess now we know why, the Wagner family. What can we say about the Wagner family members who committed this crime? Let's start with Jake. At least he told the truth. The other Wagner, I suppose, his story's yet to be told. And George, here today, this was his last ditch effort, hoping that there was some mistake in the evidence or technicality 
that might just set him free. But Angela, wow, what mother plots and plans to murder three other mothers? Two young mothers nursing their infants at the time of their death. What kind of mother is she? Now, none of those Wagners want to face capital punishment conviction. They don't want the death penalty. They don't want to die. How ironic is that? Well, karma drives a big bus, and you will eventually reap what you have been sown, and you will pay the price for what you have done. No one even must do anything, because it is true what comes around goes around. To you, Hannah was just collateral damage in your sick and twisted plan. Her life meant absolutely nothing to you, but to our family, she meant everything. We love her and we miss her, and we would give anything to have her back. Instead, she has been laid to rest beside the grandparents that raised her on that same dead end road, only about 300 feet from the same driveway where she always caught the school bus. This is a very sad story, and what makes it even more sad is that it is true. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Judge Deary, for this time to address the court today. May I speak directly to the defendant? I'll permit you to do that within reason, but I have to regulate somewhat. But I'll, I'll let you. I, I prefer that you address your comments to me, but if there's something that you feel that you need to say to the defendant, I'll permit you to do that. Okay. George Wagner IV, let me introduce myself. You see, you said out here enough that you never met my daughter, Hannah Hazel Gilly. I'm her mom, Andrea Shoemaker. I stand here today to be her voice since you, George Wagner IV, and your evil family took her. I'm supposed to stand here today and give a victim's impact statement. I have no idea, I have never done any sort of paper like this. And I have no idea, I've never done anything like this. So I did what most people do, I Googled it. But as soon as the word victim popped up, I looked at the definition. Just to see what exactly it says. Victim means a person harmed, injured, or killed as a result of a crime, accident, or other event or action. Wow, now that's powerful, because that is what, it's, what the evil George Wagner family, George Wagner IV and your evil family have done. My victim's list, Chris Rohde Sr., the young age of 40, years old, Dana Lynn Roden, only the young age of 37. I was just getting to know you as lo not long before you welcomed my sweet Hannah Hazel Gilly into your family. Both of you actually loved her, your grandchildren. My heart breaks for all of you, for all of your grandchildren as they will never know the great Papa and Nana you truly were. They will only hear stories about how wonderful you really are. As for Chris Sr., my heart breaks, aches for your mother to have to, to have lost two sons in one night. Just so unfair to her. For Dana's mom and dad, the pain of her, both her, her, your parents, till for you, your father, to not live on this earth, to see justice for his daughter, so heartbreaking, two lives taken, too soon, but never forgotten. Kenneth Roby, only the age, young age of 44 years old. <coughs> I know this, this much about this man, that he loved his nephew, my grandson, Ruger Roby, because he stopped at Frankie and Hannah's Hazel's home all the time. 
a great friend, my oldest daughter, as where she seen him every day he ate dinner where she worked. A father figure to my son. Oh, how my heart breaks for your mother. A life taken too soon, but never forgotten. Gary Roden, a young age of 38 years old. I do dislike the fact that I, have no, I never got to know you, but seeing you in the garage under the hood of a vehicle as Hannah, her son, Ruger Roden, and I sat on a sheet in her yard or on the porch, just missed that so much. Another life taken too soon, but never forgotten. Christopher Roden Jr. Only the sweet six, age of sweet 16. Just a child that was still learning about life, not a, now unable to live it. Oh, how I miss your sassy mouth and your fierce attitude for someone to kill or stand and watch as you are being killed is the devil. Hannah Mae Roden. Only the young age of 19 years old. As George Wagner IV said, this girl is like a little sister to me. Hannah Mae and my son was the first to give me my biological granddaughter. Her name is Kylie. Hannah Mae was such an innocent young lady, a great mother to two beautiful girls. I watch your baby girl Kylie mourn mourn to know who her mommy was. I, I answer questions that should have never had to be asked in the first place. My heart is forever broken that she and her sister will never know the mommy you were. Another life taken too soon but never forgotten. Frankie Roden, my soon-to-be son-in-law, the young man that gave me my first grandson, Ruger, the love you have for my beautiful baby girl, Hannah Hazel, as well as your two sons, the birthdays, the Easter's, the mornings of Christmas, just all the sports and holidays that were taken from you, from you. Oh, how my heart aches to see you, to hug you, to have you pester me to have you eat all of what I cook for dinner and lunch. My heart aches for you, son, your sons. One was only the age of three when the evil George Wagner IV, who said you were like his best friend and his evil family, all were cowards and killed you. My grandson was made an orphan in one night. I see the pain in Ruger's eyes. He mourns for a dad! So bad! And it is something he will do for the rest of his life is want his daddy. Oh. And Hannah Hazel Gilly, my baby girl, only the age of 20, gone mad, who fell in love with a young man, Frankie Roden, the love of Hannah Hazel Gilly's life. Hannah Hazel was the first of my children to give me the blessing of becoming a mammal. And Hannah Hazel Gilly, Lost my spot. Hannah, Hannah Hazel Gilly was a first time mom to her beautiful son Ruger. And what a mommy she was. She loved her son with her whole heart. And for her to only have six months, six months of his life. That is the one thing she wanted to see in her whole young life is to watch him grow up, watch him hunt eggs at Easter time. The look on his face when he sees the Easter bunny the, for the first time. The look on his face on Christmas morning after Santa came. And his reindeers left the gifts 
because he made the nice list. Open presents for birthdays. Just all the fun things a mommy and daddy do together. My baby girl, I miss you beyond words. Another life taken way too soon, but will never be forgotten. Number nine, the list of victims gets longer. The eight lives are just the ones no longer on this earth. We are, we as a new family, the Gilly, Manleys, and the Rogans have all suffered, no matter being the grandmother, grandfather, mother, father, brother, sisters, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, cousins, friends, true best friends, children left with only a mom, children left with only a father, and children without a mom and dad at all. We are all suffering, hurting, always heartbroken, forever without our children. All because the devils like the dark. Devils hunt at night, just like you, George Wagner IV, and your evil family did on Friday, April the 21st and 22nd of 2016. Next, the word impact, what it means. Have a strong effect on someone or something. Hmm. Oh, what an impact the evil George Wagner and his family have had on me. I went to sleep on a Thursday, April 21st, 2016. Was woke up in the early hours of April 22nd, 2016 from what I thought was a simple nightmare that I couldn't remember. Made coffee like any other morning. Later that morning, got a call and a message saying, get to Frankie and Hannah Hazel's because there's been, a, has been an accident and they need you, you to get Ruger. I asked what kind of accident. Response, from this person, I can't tell you. So I rushed to Union Hill Road and State Route 32, which is only five minutes away when you're speeding 80 and 90 miles per hour. And my thoughts within the five minute ride was, what kind of accident could happen? Frankie must have, Frankie's must have wrecked, must have, excuse me, Frankie's ass, this is what I said, must have wrecked, must have been driving fast. As I arrived at Union Hill Road, no, I'm, and my thoughts within that five minutes was kind of accident could have happened. Frankie must have wrecked Hannah Hazel and she is unconscious and Children's Services needs me to get Ruger. And this is where I said the A word. And I'm going to kick Frankie's butt for driving fast. Arrived at the Union Hill Road 32 only to see the road was blocked by a sheriff's deputy. I told him who I was and he told me to pull over to the side of the road. I did as he asked. So I called the person who called me in the first place and asked about my Hannah Hazel. Response, I got Hannah May. This was repeated so many times that I can't remember until I said, yes, Hannah May. Response, I got was that she's dead. And I said, what? So what about Hannah Hazel? Is she dead? Response from the other end of that call, yes. I lost all sense of feeling at that moment. Came to a few minutes later on the ground with a, someone asking me, what's going on? And I screamed, Hannah's dead! Hannah's dead! Jumped to my feet, because I still had to get my grandson. At least that's what I thought. Because I hadn't had a chance to meet Kylie, because, but knew she was my granddaughter, because she looked just like her dad, Charlie when she was born. Then the news, media, etc., started gathering like vultures on a dead deer carcass just to get the story that was our life, our life. Still here today. We were moved to a church where all sorts of family and friends started gathering. We went to the sheriff's stations to answer questions, give statements, but I wanted answers. That's what I got from DCI agents. 
He knows who he, he knows who he is, and I thank him for answering them. Then all the family was put into this church and to be told by a screen from a press conference that our family was dead. Next, I was sitting on the, some steps outside the church and a man woke, walked up to me and said, my name is Rob Junk. I'm the prosecutor from Pike County. If this person or people that did this would be brought before a judge, would you want the death penalty? And I said, yes, an eye for an eye. What is what an eye for an eye is what my mama always taught me. Speaking of parents, my dad mourned himself to death over the loss of his granddaughter, Hannah Hazel. As well as me, speaking as well as Frankie's and Hannah Mae's. So I feel as if you killed my dad when you and your family took eight lives in one night. The fact that all Hannah Hazel's, Gilly's nieces, nephews, cousins, aunts, uncles, sisters, brothers, and good friends still suffer with heartache. My dear, lost. <laughs> heartache to see her, to hug her, to hear her voice, just to hear, hear, just to have her in their lives like she once was. My many regrets. I have many regrets, and what ifs, because of the devils you are. Finally, the word statement, which means <laughs> a definition or a clear expression of something in a speech or writing. I pray to God that you get to see the heartbreaks for all them. To have to tell you, a very young child that their Uncle Nana and Aunt Frankie went to heaven is unbearable. Yes, I said that right because that's what they were called, Uncle Nana and Aunt Frankie. Whew. I went to see, I went from seeing my grandson, Ruger, every day until the day I found out she was dead. Then he was placed in strangers' arms and I went two months without seeing him at all. Then we fought to get him in our family where his mommy would have wanted him. And I know I know George Wagner's fourth and his family have no idea how to deal <coughs> how, how to, how, when dealing with a child. I hope they have no deal with dealing with the child again and I pray to God that your son learns what kind of a monster you really are and never wants anything to do with you. I pray for that. I pray for you not to live. I want you to die just like you and your evil family did my baby girl, Hannah Hazel Gilly, Frankie Roden, Hannah Mae Roden, Chris Roden Jr., Dana Lynn Roden, Chris Roden Sr., Kenneth Roden, and Gary Roden. Life in prison is just too easy. You get free meals, free television, free living. When there are all, kid, all kinds of kids starving to death, you are a waste of time and space on this earth. So much of the taxpayer's dollars wasted on your court hearings and a trial while you sat there knowing you helped plot, plan, plotted, and carried out the killings of eight people in one night. Excuse me, seven ravens and one gilly in one night. I still wait for her to come through my door, all the while answering questions from her son, wanting to know things about his mommy and his daddy, as well as Hannah May's little girl. Have you ever had to deal with things like that? No, George Wagner IV. You haven't, because you told your own son that your, mo your own mother was his mommy. 
how sick and twisted is the Wagner family. Thank God none of you did it, get to raise those kids to be adults, because those four babies would, would have turned out like the devils you and jo you, George Wagner, and the rest of your family are. All I want is my baby girl, Hannah Hazel, and that I will never have. I only agree to the state because I want all these older fam families to get justice on earth while they're still here because of the fact that Gary's dad, Dana's dad, and my dad didn't get their justice while on this earth. This is the most mon monstrous act. Your cousin said it the best <laughs> that any family could have done to three different families and George Wagner the fourth. What have you won? What have you won after all you've done? Thank you to everyone that worked on this case. A special thanks to the jury for seeing the devils that George Wagner the fourth is. Thank you, John. Brian, Alan, Angie, Rob, Andy, Cindy, and Amy, for all that you have done for my baby girl. And I thank you, Judge. And I pray, Judge Deary, that you see the true devil that George Wagner the Fourth really is, and make him suffer with life in prison. Thank you. As I stand here today, I know I should put for peace. I should have peace because you have been found guilty on all 22 counts. I should feel relief that justice is being served. But there is no real justice, and peace is not a feeling I have. Hannah Mae was my peace, and because of you and your family, she is gone. Eight lives taken and so many more traumatized by the horrendous acts committed by the Wagner family. For months, I was riddled with questions of who and why. I tried to find solace in the belief that most of my family members died instantly from being shot in the head. Unfortunately, that was not true. When signing for my father's lifeless body, the coroner stated my father died within minutes of being shot. <coughs> minutes, not seconds. So now I'm left wondering for how long did he remain consci conscious? Did he feel the pain? How long was he conscious for, knowing his death was imminent and there was nothing he could do? What went through his mind in those moments that I imagined felt like hours as he died alone? What about Hannah Mae as she lied next to her nursing infant? Did she die in fear, not knowing what would happen to her child? How long did she lie there helplessly, knowing she could do nothing to protect her infant from the evil that stormed, from, stormed through her home that night? The questions were accompanied by nightmares night after night. Lack of sleep drove me crazy. I thought I could not escape it. Every time I closed my eyes, I was taken back to that horrific moment. I found out that my family was murdered and what I believed they went through. Screaming out in horror for Hannah to wake up and run as her attacker approaches, but nothing I done changed the outcome. Unfortunately, when I woke, it, I still could not escape the terror. It was and is still real. It wasn't just another terrifying dream. Sons and daughters left without their mothers and fathers, a mother giving, grieving her son, a daughter-in-law, and her grandkids. Some of his life was just beginning, one as young as 16 years old. I begged for anything to stop the never-ending pain and grief to the point I nearly ended my own life in December of 2017. In 2018, I had my daughter. It should have been a moment filled with nothing but joy. Instead, it was filled with heartache, knowing my father would never hold my daughter. My daughter frequently asked to see Papal King, a man she never got to meet. I am burdened with telling her she can't, and naturally she asked why. 
She sees me cry and holds on to me because I have no words to offer other than Papo Tin lies with Jesus. She will never know his unconditional love. She will never get to hold his rough but gentle hands. She will never get to experience how Papo Tin's strong embrace made the world melt away and made everything better. Now as I plan for my wedding, I dread walking down the aisle because my father will not be walking with me or handing me over as a father should. I won't look over to the bridesmaids and see Hannah May as my maid of honor. I won't see Frankie in the crowd making some sort of commotion to make me laugh and calm my nerves. Christopher won't be there as the life of the party making a scene as his usual goofy self. Furthermore, I'm reminded that Hannah won't be there for her daughter's first heartbreak to comfort them. She won't be there to teach them and help them grow into the beautiful women they will be. Hannah will not be there to prepare them for their big days. She couldn't even be there for her youngest daughter's first steps. Frankie will not be there to teach his boys how to be men. He won't be there to share knowledge and prepare them for the hardships of the world. You see, eight lives were taken in the most brutal of ways, but many more lives were stolen. You took moments that were no more yours to take than the life you and your family took. I am sorry you never got to know the unconditional love of a mother and father, but it does not excuse your participation in the grim murders your family committed as a whole. You yourself state that anyone who committed such a horrendous crime should be punished with death. My family and I are not asking for your demise, but I do ask that you receive the max penalty. It is not justice, but I believe in my heart it is the closest we can get. come up here. Um, my first little statement is actually one that my son had written himself, a victim of the night, who has now since turned 10. Um, there's a lot of things that he doesn't even want to discuss with me. There's a lot of things that he doesn't even come to me and talk to me about because he's scared. But he has written this himself and brought it to me. These are things that he hasn't even discussed with me and he wanted George to know. Dear George, I find myself wondering why you killed my daddy. There are things that make me sad because I can't learn from him. He could have taught me stuff like working on derby cars and coon hunting. My mommy tried, but it's not as good as daddy was. <laughs> I have been scared since that night knowing bad guys came into my house while I was sleeping. I am always scared now that I will lose my mommy. You did that to me. I just want you to know that I hate you and your family. These are the words of a 10 year old boy. Just to grow up without a dad who doesn't have, doesn't have a dad. I couldn't imagine that. Your kid is only six months old, younger than mine. No, he doesn't have his dad. Just want to follow with my own little statement here. The impact death has on, ch on children can be difficult. They feel it. They understand it, no matter how old they are. For a child that has the parent murdered while they sleep in another room and being watched as they sleep is honestly, there's just no word for it. For him to tell me, he watched his daddy's hand fall while he tried to wake him up because his baby brother's scream is traumatic itself. I don't know to this day what he has seen in that bedroom, and I think he has shut it out, or I at least pray that he has shut it out. But knowing that he has seen stuff hurts my heart so much. The sleepless nights, the panic attacks, and constant worry is so exhausting. You and your family did that, not thinking of what, not thinking of that though made, when you made those choices to end multiple lives. You made decisions thinking it would make your life easier. How about a boy who's missed out on growing up with his brother? The one person who gets him in this mess misses out on those things. 
Did you know at the time there is no childhood therapist, trauma therapist, who cover Ohio's largest crime in or around Scioto County? As a single mom who was only 21 years old at the time, dealing with losing people so close to her, had to travel just to get her kid the care he needed to be so strong. And just to have to be so strong for someone who is dealing with that, with far more than I could have ever imagined. You know what kept me going through? Knowing I had an amazing support system to keep me going, even though it bothered them too secretly, I know her heart breaks, and that is my mama. That is what a real mom does. They don't cower down and plot to kill an entire family because they don't get their way. My mother has loved every one of these rodents, including Hannah Hazel. They still treated us as family because you can have a civil relationship even if you're not together. I was always raised to love someone. I still love the father of my child. We were just better apart. It made the real thing that mattered happier knowing his parents were happy together or apart. That's called healthy co-parenting. I look now, back now on the times I had to spend with you and your family afterwards. The times that you guys wanted to be so close to me, and now I get it. I felt so uncomfortable, but I wanted so bad for B to still have a relationship with the Sophie Suds, but I knew deep down. I didn't ruin that. Jake told me I did, but I didn't ruin that. You and your family did. The moral of me getting up here, though, is to continue to show my baby how strong I am and will continue to be. This is his story, and I'm just living it. We may have been friends in the past, but for you to get up here on that stand and take an oath and still lie with me, excuse me, Honor, but I hope you burn in hell, George. I will say there's one thing I have learned is that God wants us to forgive, and maybe one day I will forgive you, but at this time I just can't. Thank you, Your Honor. Hello, my name is April Manley. I'm the wife of James Manley, brother Dana Rogan. As I stand here today, I realize I'm standing here for my father-in-law, Leonard. See, Leonard fought a short fight with liver cancer. All he wanted to do was be with his baby girl, Dana Rogan, and make sure she was okay. For that reason, he wouldn't fight for his life. Leonard would tell us time and time again that he was sorry for leaving us but he just couldn't walk this world without Dana any longer. He made me promise that I would see these trials through, that I would be at every court date. So here I stand today at the end of one of them. I don't only stand here for Leonard, but myself as well. You see, James Manley and I will be married 28 years this week. The Rodents are not just, just not, The Rodents are also my family, but in heart as well. I was the maid of, maid of honor at Dana and Chris's wedding. I was at the hospital at the, at the birth of Frankie, Hannah, and little Chris, or as I call them, Spanky, Hanny, and Monkey. I was also at the birth of Frankie's boys, Hannah's girls. Due to Dana being a young mom and a full-time student and working full-time as an STNA from graduation till her death, I babysat Frankie, Hannah, and little Chris from the time they was born until they was old enough to stay by themselves. Even after they was old enough to look after themselves, I would still see them daily. That's why I referred to them as my babies. Then comes the morning of April 22nd, 2016, where all of our lives change forever and we'll never be the same again. Not one, not two, but eight family members were taken away from us. It was like the bottom fell out of my soul. Hundreds of people around me, but I felt like I walked this world alone. 
weeks of being in denial, even after seeing them laying there in their coffins, looking at them, saying, that's not my little ones. They look nothing like them. Their faces so unrecognizable. Convincing myself they were just hiding for something and they was coming back home to us as soon as it was over, but they never came home. <laughs> The Manly rodents and gillies have missed out on so much due to the rodents being taken from us way too soon. So many holidays, birthdays, weddings, births, big celebrations were taken from us. It wasn't just my life affected by the tragedy, but also of many others. My mother-in-law, Judy Manley, now walks this world without her daughter, her grandchildren, her son-in-law. Our friends, Kenneth and Gary, but now she also walks this world without her husband, Leonard, who just couldn't handle it, the pain any longer. To this day, my husband starts screaming, sis, in his sleep. It's the only thing he called Dana. My oldest son, who's a firefighter, says he has seen some gruesome things as a firefighter, but nothing will ever compare to seeing Frankie and Hannah laying there and all that blood. You see, Frankie wasn't only his cousin, that was his best friend. I watched my youngest son walk across the stage at his high school graduation with a picture of Hannah Mae pinned on his gown with a cap and tassel so Hannah Mae could graduate with him like she was intended to do. Within the group of her fellow classmates sat an empty chair with Hannah's picture and her cap and her gown. My stepson was never afraid of the dark. He is now 15 years old and still won't go outside by himself after dark. He says they came in the dark and took them all away. Before that night, he was never afraid. My grandchildren will never meet their Aunt Dana, their Uncle Chris, their Uncle Kenneth, cousins Frankie, Hazel, Hannah, little Chris, or Gary. There's still many more family members that are missing out on the family lives because of the Wagners took upon themselves to be the judge and the jury. They decided that my family's lives were to come to an end at their hands. My mother taught me to forgive and forget, but right now I can't follow that rule. The Wagners have taken so much from us that I just can't forgive right now. I don't know I ever will. And for that reason, I hope George Wagner spends the rest of his life in prison without seeing your loved ones for the rest of your life, just like you made sure we wouldn't see ours. I hope you feel the loneliness and the emptiness that we feel for the rest of your life. And I have one last wish, wish for you, George, since you and your family made sure you were the last ones to see our family alive. I hope every night when you close your eyes, you see them eight faces, and I hope they haunt you for the rest of your life. Thank Bobby Manley and writing this letter because I believe my voice needs to be heard. I would like to thank the prosecuting attorneys and the jury for their time. I'm Dana's baby sister, the aunt of Frankie, Hannah, and Chris Jr. I'm here speaking on behalf of them and the other lives that you took from us. I have many feelings, but the strong one is grief. On April 22nd, 2016, you changed my life and many other lives. You came like thieves in the night and took my family from us. It is not fair what you did. There is no real explanation what you did or why. Since that day, you have shown no remorse. You have sat there and laughed, smirked, and mocked my family, all while lying and saying that you had nothing to do with it. You're a coward, and you're not worth oxygen you're wasting right now. Sadly, with the death penalty off the table, 
I can only hope that they lock you up for the rest of your miserable life. I can't believe you have the audacity to sit there and act like you didn't do this. It disgusts me that you're allowed to exist. It disgusts me that you're allowed to breathe the same air that I am breathing. That's enough about you because this day is not about you. This day is about my family and the people you have hurt and traumatized. This day is about Chris Jr., who was only 16 years old, and because of you and your family, he will forever be 16 years old. Today is about Hannah Mae, who was only 19 years old. Frankie and Hannah Gilly, who will never get to watch their children grow up, but neither will you. Your child will remember nothing about you, except that you're a monster and a murderer. They were just babies and had hardly started their lives. Now, we will never know who they may have become. This day isn't about you. This day is about my sister, Dana Roden, and getting justice for her and her family. You only murdered Chris Roden and Gary Roden and Kenneth Roden because you are a coward and you know they would retaliate. They were all completely innocent and hadn't done anything to you or your family. There's a special place in hell for you and your entire family. I hope your life is long and miserable. I hope you think of my family and what you have done every day for the rest of your miserable existence. Thank you. You know, I'm just curious that uh, now we have to see from Ruth Rubin. Ruth Roden, Victim Impact Statement. I would like you to know that you killed more than eight people. Kenny, Gary's father, literally grieved himself to death over the murder of his son and the others in the family. Gary was a good-hearted person and he would give you the shirt off of his back. He never missed his father's birthday or mine. He made it to every holiday. I truly feel that you did so much more of these crimes and that you're just not admitting to them. Today, December 19th, is Gary's birthday. He would have been 45 years old. I ask for justice for Gary and the other members in this family. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Kayla, and I am the niece to Chris, Kenneth, and Dana, and a cousin to Gary, Hannah Mae, Hannah Hazel, uh, Frankie, and little Christopher. <coughs> this is not a victim impact statement for myself or the rest of my family. This is a plea that you sentence this man to the maximum penalty for all charges. George may not have shot anyone as it was told or an attempt to lessen his role, but he was still there with the intent to kill to kill at least one victim. He helped plan this, he helped in executing it, and then he helped in trying to cover it up. He helped hand a death sentence to all eight victims, and then he helped, I'm oh, sorry, lost my, but your honor, this isn't just about these eight victims whose lives were taken. This is also about four children. Four children whose lives were torn apart because of this man and his actions. Brittany must live with the fact that he woke up to find his daddy and soon-to-be stepmommy dead. He had to see his baby brother covered in blood. We don't know what would have happened had he woke up while three men were in his home, and we thank God every day that he didn't. But Brittany at least has his mommy, who can be both parents, but he will forever have a part of him that will never heal from this because he will never have his father or his close family again. Ruger will never know what it was like to have both parents, and he was so young that he will never remember them or remember the love that they had for him. That's the same for Kylie. She will never know her mother's love or the possibility of having a father who chose to be that to her. Lastly, Sophia must grow up living with the fact that not only was her family murdered, but they were murdered supposedly because of her. 
and that it was her father and his family who had done it. See, all of us in the Roden family and Gilly families try to make life as normal as we can for them, and we try to show them that they are loved. So I ask you, Your Honor, to please sentence this man to the maximum pos penalty possible because he sentenced eight people to death and four children to a life sentence of pain and suffering. He does not deserve freedom outside the walls of a prison cell. Thank you. I'm Lisa Kristen Kenneth Sneese. Thank you, Your Honor, for allowing me to speak on behalf of my family today. I will continue to be your voice. And we'll be relentless in making sure justice is served. I am not only here to make an impact statement, but to appeal to you, Your Honor, to give George Wagner life without the possibility of parole. Growing up, our parents tell us Monsters do not exist. But I had come to know that as a lie in my adult life. Make no mistake about it, George. You want to betray an innocent act and act like you were distant from your family, but the hard truth is you are one and the same. <coughs> the same heartless monster who helped brutally murder eight people and never once backed out or reached out to stop this cruel act before it happened. It's hard to truly convey the impact of something of this magnitude. There are so many moments that have made an impact on me greatly over the last eight years, six years, sorry. But a few of those moments are very painful moments that I will forever remember vividly. Going into a funeral home and seeing eight caskets lying along the wall of our loved ones Walking into that room with my family. <sighs> Hearing the screams from my mother, my aunt, and my uncles while trying to hold them up because the legs gave away. I think everyone in that room felt their pain and would have done anything to take it away. That night, when it came time to say our final goodbyes and close the caskets, I'm sure our screams and sobs were heard from outside. As we had to be pulled away from that room, my grandmother, bearing two children and three grandchildren, no one should ever have that burden and pain. Six years and eight months later, we still have these unbearable moments where we feel like we can just break, knowing the callous way they were taken from us. If this is not enough to convince someone George is a cold-hearted monster who deserves to never leave prison, he stood outside my 16-year-old cousin's door waiting for his brother to go in and assassinate my little cousin. Little Chris went to bed on April 21st to get ready for school the next day. And he would never wake again. He would never wake again. This cold, hearted, barbaric man who said Hannah Mae was a baby sister stood by while his brother went into her room and murdered her while his newborn baby girl lay beside her. He stood and my cousin Ricky's trailer again, supposedly his friend, while his brother slaughtered my cousin and his fiance, while their baby lay between them. And Frankie's little boy lay sleeping on the couch. His son, who was three at the time, would be the one who would go into Frankie's room to see his daddy and his daddy, his daddy's fiance covered in blood. And they wouldn't wake up. This is a scene of utter devastation that no one should ever have to witness, let alone a three-year-old child. Four children without parents, three parents who are forever missing birthdays, holidays, and milestones with their children. Ruger, who is without both parents,
was too young to know how much he was really loved by his parents. Kylie, you will never get to experience her mother's love. Brantley, who deserved his father's guidance and love throughout his life. Sophia, who would not only lose her mommy on April 22nd, but she lost all of her immediate family. And then on November the 13th, 2018, she lost her dad's side of her immediate family, regardless of the monsters they are, she still had a bond. The devastation and impact will forever weigh heavy on her for the rest of her life. I've tried to wrap my head around why my family was given death sentences, but nothing will justify the why. My cousin, Hannah Mae, was given a death sentence because she was a strong-willed mother who wanted to raise her daughter and continue to grow her family outside the Wagner's control. My cousin Gary, Hannah Hazel, little Chris, and my Aunt Nana was given a death sentence for just simply being there. My cousin Frankie, my Uncle Chris, and my uncle Kenneth were given a death sentence for being the protectors of our family. It's sickening to think this is what caused the tragic loss of eight people. George Wagner made a decision, and as a result of his actions, eight lives were senselessly lost. He is just as guilty and should be held just as accountable. He is just the coward <coughs> who made our family sit through a horrific trial when he knows the devastation that he helped create. No amount of justice given in this court will come close to what is deserved. But this man deserves nothing less than to spend the rest of his life in prison. This man and his family has confined our family to our own personal hell that we have to fight to get through every day. So it's only just that George is confined to a prison cell for the rest of his life. George. I hope that my family haunts your dreams at night just like they do ours. I also hope there are days where you miss your family and son so much you literally feel like you could die from the pain because that one is what our family deals with. I pray, George, that this court and the prison you are sent to show you the same mercy that you showed my family. The day you take your last breath, you will face your maker, and I pray they have no mercy on your soul. But on that day, I will finally have a little bit of peace. My name is Tony Rodney. I come here today to talk about my family and the memories that I have of them. First of all, I would like to thank the court and the state of Ohio for giving me the opportunity to do so as a victim. I lost two brothers, Chris Roden Sr., Kenneth Roden. I also lost a niece, Hannah Roden. I also lost two nephews, Frankie Roden, Chris Roden Jr. I also lost a cousin, Gary Roden. I also lost a sister-in-law, Dana Roden Manley. I also lost my nephew Frankie's fiance, Hannah Hazel Gill. My brother Chris, my mom's son, as a boy, he always had a lot of questions, just about things like, Tony, why does the chicken have two legs? Or, Tony, why does the water flow that way? He loved playing in the creek. When in the creek, we would get up, Chris and I and my other brothers, Stephen and Kenneth, would build small toy boats. We'd use whatever we could find. And we'd have boat races. I would let them win sometimes. Three of them, one of me. We would take five-gallon buckets and get behind skunks that was in our garden. Sneak, put the buckets on them. Catch them. 
So catching them in buckets, but not thinking about how to get the lids off of the buckets <laughs> without getting sprayed. So we would turn them loose. To this day, I do not know how we didn't get sprayed. Chris hated school. As a young boy, I would have to chase him down and carry him to the bus. We all would wait for the bus to pull up the lane. Then, when it would, he would run across the cornfield. But later, as a teenager, he began to like school a little better. But still didn't want to be there. He could go three days a week and still was able to get straight A's. He could not wait to get a job and make money. I always admired his ability to watch and learn. <coughs> Him and I and Robin, our boss, and a gentleman by the name of, that we called Paul. Paul was 70 years old at the time. We built a playground, a pirate ship, just from us four getting together and talking. Chris always had the ability to look at a project and bring it to life. I love that about him. Chris got married and had three kids. He loved them. Was a big softy when it came to them. And I would talk about parenting with him a lot. Chris loved to work. He loved spending time with his family. He was very soft-spoken. People would ask me often, Tony, does your brother Chris ever talk? I would reply, that's his nature. If Chris could help someone, he would. No matter if he knew them or not, he would help. We would talk about fireworks a lot. He loved fireworks. Chris would always do research on fireworks and keep me up to date. I believe he got that from our dad which also loved fireworks. I have so many memories of my brother Chris that I wish I could put them all down on paper. So whoever hears this today could see through my memories <coughs> how my brother Chris really was. Caring, gracious, loving, family man, and kind. He taught me a lot. And I hope I was able to do the same for him. His life cut short by selfish acts of others. My brother Kenneth, my mom's son, as a young boy, he would always hang out with me and my other brothers, Chris, Stephen, and Brady. We would have mud fights in the creek. But when we got in trouble for doing that, Kenneth somehow got less punishment. For it, he always would have that innocent look about him. As a young boy and a, teen junior, a teenager, excuse me, he was a hard worker, loved old cars and old trucks, even at a young age. <clears throat> loved his family, and he always showed it. When he married, he adopted two kids, loved them as his own. True love, he always had a way of showing them. I always admired that about him, the love he had for his kids, and not just his kids, all kids. I always felt I was the lucky one to be able to work with him and just see how as a hard worker he really was. A gracious, kind, caring, loving man. So many memories of him make me very sad when I think of him he had so much to offer other ones. His love for other people, all cut short by selfish acts of others. My niece Hannah, at a young age, her toys were hers. But if she liked you, then you could touch them, then play with them. When she became a little older, she would tag along with her brothers, Frankie and Christopher, come to my house to play pool with my kids. I had to be a referee in those games quite often. At a young age, she had two kids of her own. Right from the first one, you could see 
the love and caring she had in her for her kid. A true love from your mother touches the heart. She had that. Her children will not get to experience that from their true mother. My mom's granddaughter. Her life cut short by selfish acts of others. My nephew Frankie, as a young kid, he would get into everything. When times at my house, he would want to touch whatever he could. I would tell him, leave that alone or I will cut your ears off. <laughs> he loved the outdoors, loved to hunt. We would talk about it often. I miss those conversations. He had two children. <clears throat> of them, a loving dad was becoming a good worker. His children were not to get experience the true love of their dad, my mom's grandson. His life cut short by selfish acts of others. My nephew, Christopher. I like to refer to him as little Chris. When little, he would walk around with his belly hanging out, his shirt. I would tell him, pull your shirt up. He would, but then that belly would pop right back out. If it had a motor on it, he was on it. He loved riding motors. One time my boss at work let him take a brand new Reaper. They were like small Jeeps for a test ride. My boss told him, do not go off the main road in the campground. Did he listen? Nope. Went trail riding and found the biggest mud hole he could and buried that reaper in it. Well, guess what? Guess who got the phone call? Uncle Tony, he says. What are you doing? I say, house chores. He says, drop that and come get me. I am stuck in a mud hole. So we talked a bit, so I leave to get him out of the mud hole. When I arrived, he and his friend Tyler had that reaper buried so bad, you could barely see the seats. Took me a while to get it out. After that, I believe my boss had to sell it as a used one. Mud stains was not coming out. Little Chris gets his driver's license. Hitting me up for gas money. Gosh, anybody that has got their license for the first time knows that feeling. That feeling of freedom, hanging out with friends, driving around, and listening to music. My mom's grandson, his life cut short by selfish acts of others. My cousin, Gary, my mom's nephew. As a kid, he would put rocks in my boots because he thought it was funny. As he got older, he liked pestering people. He knew if he pestered you enough, he would get a laugh out of you. He would always help people. <clears throat> I would be working with him. We would stop at store to get something to drink. I'd say, Gary, go in and get us something to drink, and he would. But he also bought lottery tickets out of my money. <clears throat> Loved his family. His life cut short by selfish acts of others. My sister-in-law, <clears throat> Dana, my mom's daughter, always spoke her mind. She would come to my house and tell me what I needed to do at my own house. When she walked in a room with other people in it, she would always have people laughing. She loved people, and it showed. She loved her family, would do anything for them. Her life cut short by selfish acts of others. Also, my nephew Frankie's fiance, Hannah Hazel Gilly, just started their lives together. Very nice, respectful person. I always like to refer to her, to her, as little Hannah. She told me that was fine if I did that. She could tell, <clears throat> I could tell, that she was going to be a good mother to her newborn that she just had. Her life cut short by selfish acts of others. 
I have talked about each one of my family members a little bit, but to, real, to really know who they was as a person, we would have to talk about all the memories of them all. Now I would like to talk, tell a story that is true to its core. On November the 13th, 2018, there was an arrest in the murders of my family the same year around Christmas time. My sister Wilma played phone tag back and forth trying to get the authorities to let Sophia and Bullvine spend Christmas dinner at our family. So it happened and all the kids just loved them. <clears throat> and at this Christmas dinner, our mom was handing out presents to her younger grandchildren and her great grandchildren. So they all filing through, sitting on mom's lap as she hands their present to them. Pictures were being taken. And then Bullvine's name is called. He walks up to mom, she puts him on her lap. <clears throat> she hands him the present, pictures are taken. She puts him down and gives him a hug. I am sitting in the kitchen, crying as I watch. Bullvine is no relation to our family, but he is the defendant's son. True love, that's what was showed that Christmas dinner. It was embedded by our mom to all of her kids. We all have it in us. Chris taught it to his kids, it showed. Kenneth taught it to his, and it still shows true love. I'd like to read this statement from my mom. Geneva Roden. George Wagner, you are still breathing. My two sons are not breathing. My grandchildren, are not breathing. They are all children left behind. <coughs> I'd just like to see some justice. Thank you, Young.
I think I'm good with, uh, right. yeah, I've got two bars, so. <laughs> <laughs>
Does the state have anything further to present with regard to sentencing? No, Your Honor. Does the defense wish to present something today? Judge, just a brief word. Uh, Judge, as the court is very much aware, we filed a sentencing memorandum with the state court's review. We won't repeat the arguments we made there. With respect to the actual sentence itself, we would suggest and argue that the aggravated burglary and tampering with evidence charges merge with the aggravated murders. And ask the court to take that into consideration. That's it. So, um, the only other thing, you know, my client obviously has a right to say anything he wants. Uh, in discussing this with him, he's not going to make a statement. The court heard his testimony. Uh, he maintains his innocence. We would simply ask that at the appropriate time, uh, the court appoint appellate counsel and we find some cause based on his presidential <coughs> status. And we file, <coughs> excuse me, we file a poverty affidavit um, with the motion for appointment of counsel, which applies to the cost of fines. Thank you. Right, you, you indicated that you felt what merged? The, the, um, the, um, the aggravated burglaries associated with the aggravated murders, and, and I believe the court instructed the alternative of tampering with evidence when, when the jury was considering the aggravated burglaries and murders and the alternative of tampering with evidence. So we think, uh, based on the facts and, and the jury's verdict, that those counts <coughs> State's, uh, what the state wish to respond to the statement of the uh, defense counsel's uh, statement concerning the merger of any defense? Yeah, Your Honor, I, I'm unclear what basis. I, they've not stated a legal reason why they believe it merges, but it absolutely does not merge. The tampering with evidence and aggravated burglary would not merge. There's no legal rationale for that. And what else? I don't know. It was, it was the 
that the aggravated burglaries took place with the purpose to commit aggravated murder or tampering with evidence, I believe is the instruction. And so that's what we're based on. Still separate crimes and still, still uh, uh, committed with separate animus, so. Uh, Mr. Wagner, is there any reason that you want to state as to why uh, sentence should not be pronounced and imposed immediately in this matter. No. Is there anything that you wish to say on your own behalf or any information you wish to provide in mitigation of punishment? No. Prior to imposing sentence, uh, the court wishes to make just two or three observations here. First of all, no sentence that the court may impose in this case would right the wrong that has been inflicted upon the victims and their families. Uh, murder is a is an irreversible act. Um, and although time may alleviate the pain of loss, it has not obviously at this point and, and may never, but although it might at some point, it will not and cannot restore to the victim's families what was and what might have been had the lives of their loved ones not been unlawfully taken and cruelly taken on that uh, night in April 2016. The court does find that uh, these murders uh, do constitute the worst form of the offense. They involve invasion of the victim's uh, homes. And in three of the cases, invasion of their bedrooms or sleeping areas, uh, places where uh, the families, the persons involved, the victims involved had lain down to sleep. Uh, in two of the homes, uh, uh, from the evidence, victims had infants in the bedrooms with them at the time. Um, the invasions at, at uh, three of the locations appear to have been calculated to find the victims in bed asleep. Uh, in fact, uh, some, by the evidence, were apparently asleep. Uh, the court's sentences and the process for imposing sentences, it was referred to somewhat by counsel here, are governed by law and the statutes that apply. And I want to sort of outline some of this, although it was done so in, in uh, somewhat on the oral arguments here. Of course, both sides have filed sentencing memorandum. Uh, the court is to be guided by what's referred to in the statute 29-29-11 of uh, as overriding purposes of felony sentencing. And there are three of those named there. One of them is to protect the public from future crime by the offender and others. Another is to punish the offender. And a third is to promote the effective rehabilitation of the offender using the minimum sanctions that the court determines accomplish those purposes without imposing an unnecessary burden on state or local government resources. That's, that's statutory language. It also says to achieve these purposes, the sentencing court shall consider the need for in incapacitating the offender, deterring the offender and others from future crime, rehabilitating the offender, and making restitution to the um, victim of the offense, the public, or both. The sentence to be imposed, this again is statutory language, uh, the, the sentence to be imposed for a felony shall be reasonably calculated to achieve the three overriding purposes of felony sentencing. And then it's commensurate with and not demeaning to the seriousness of the offender's conduct and its impact upon the victim, in this case victims, multiple victims, uh, and consistent with sentences imposed for similar crimes committed by similar offenders. And of course, the court is not to base its sentence upon considerations uh, of race or ethnic background, gender or religion of the offender. That's all statutory directions to the courts. Um, and it goes on to say in, in the next uh, 
in the next uh, section of law, 29-29-12, that unless required by section 29-29-13 or 29-29-14 of the revised code, the court that imposes a sentence under this chapter upon the uh, offender for a felony has discretion to determine the most effective way to comply with the purposes and principles of sentencing set forth in 29-29-11 of the revised code. Now, of course, that discretion that the court has in sentencing is limited when mandatory terms are, uh, or a sentence of imprisonment is required by law, and it, as it is in this case. It says that in exercising the, the discretion, that the court is directed to do certain things, to consider the factors set forth in the statute relating to the seriousness of the conduct uh, and factors relating to the likelihood that the offend, that of the offender's recidivism. In other words, the, the likelihood that the offender will commit future crimes. Um, and also, of course, if, the, if there's been military service, the court is to consider that. That's not applicable in this case. Um, in addition, the court may consider other factors um, as well. So, and, and the attorneys addressed uh, some of these in oral argument and some in their written memorandum, but some of the factors uh, are set out in the statute that the court is to consider as indicating that the offender's conduct is more serious than conduct normally constituting uh, the offense. And one, and one of those factors is the physical or mental injury suffered by the victims uh, due to the conduct of the offender was exacerbated because of the physical or mental condition or age of the victims. All of the victims in this case uh, were relatively young. Uh, four were 20 or younger, uh, I believe, and, and two were, were teenagers. One was a minor. The oldest, I think, was 44 years of age. Uh, and as far as their, their physical condition is, is concerned, uh, six of the victims, I believe, had laid down to go to sleep, and some were actually, I believe, by the evidence, asleep when they were shot, or at least the evidence indicated that. Another factor is that the victim of the offense suffered serious physical, psychological, or economic <coughs> harm uh, as a result of the offense. In this case, of course, the victim suffered death all eight of them. Uh, some, of the other, some of the factors set forth here uh, as indicating the conduct is more serious do not apply. Uh, one, though, is that the offender's relationship, this one does apply to the, in the court's opinion, the, the offender's relationship with the victims facilitated the offense. In this case, uh, they were total strangers to each other. The uh, defendant had a uh, knowledge of the of several of the victims if not all of them uh, knew something of where they lived some some of their living uh, habits and so forth and which did facilitate the commission of the crime and, and could have also uh, added confidence to the preparation to the preparation of the crime knowing where different security uh, cameras were and things like that um, so those considerations, considering those things, you know, the court does find that the, 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 the conduct of the defendant was more serious than conduct normally constituting the offense, although aggravated murder is always serious, regardless of the facts. And, uh, there are some considerations also set forth in the statute that the court is to consider as indicating that the defendant's conduct is less serious than the conduct normally constituting the offense. The court finds actually that none of those apply in this case, but considering the factors, one can kind of contrast some of the facts in the present uh, case. One of the factors, for example, is um, you know whether the victim facilitate. Uh, whether the victim induced or facilitated the offense, or, or that the, uh, um, or that there was provocation, that the that the offender was acting under provocation, 
or that the offender did not uh, cause or expect to cause physical harm. Well, contrast the circumstances here. We had some people were killed because they were there. Some people were killed because it was anticipated that they might retaliate if, uh, this is by the evidence presented at trial, they might retaliate uh, because some of their family members had been uh, unlawfully killed. Uh, uh, and as far as whether the, uh, the offender did not expect to cause physical harm, the, the jury found that these were calculated killings. So and to, not only was, and of course part of the crime is purpose, purposeful killing. So not only did, was it anticipated that, that the harm would be caused, but it was planned that harm would be caused, death would be caused. Um, and finally, there are substantial grounds, whether there are substantial grounds to mitigate the offender's uh, conduct. Um, and and there, there's no indication of that here. Uh, the defendant, of course, testified he, he wasn't there. Uh, but others, the, the uh, co-defendants testified that he was there and participated. And uh, certainly there was no effort made uh, to stop the crimes from taking place. Uh, in fact, by the, by the testimony of the co-defendants, the defendant here was a willful planner and willful participant in the crimes. The court is also to consider factors um, regarding the offender uh, uh, concerning whether, as indicating whether the defendant is likely to commit future crimes. And when you look at those, there's no indication of any prior, at least serious convictions of crime, no findings of delinquency. Those are set forth, those are some of the considerations. Um, there's no, no uh, indication of serious drug use, pattern of drug use or alcohol use here. Uh, but number five uh, on this part of the section is whether the offender shows any remorse for the offense. And, the court, quite frankly, finds that the defendant has shown no remorse, um, just denial, in which the jury, of course, did not believe in rendering its verdict. Um, and finally, the court is to consider certain factors as indicating whether the offender uh, is not likely to commit uh, future crimes. And again, we have uh, whether he's been adjudicated, the, the offender has been adjudicated the length of child, that's not, that we have no evidence of that, whether he's uh, been convicted or, of or pled guilty to other uh, criminal offenses, and, uh, and there's no indication uh, of that. Uh, but the third says whether the offender has lived a law-abiding life for a significant number of years, and there's quite a bit of indication in the defendant's testimony himself that he did not live a law, he was not living a law-abiding life. There were several crimes uh, undetected and certainly unprosecuted, uh, that he has acknowledged in his testimony that he had uh, uh, committed. Also, uh, the, a consideration is whether the offense was committed under circumstances not likely to recur. Well, the court can't make a finding like that because the, the circumstances here involve family relationships, which if the defendant uh, went on with his life uh, in, out, out of prison, he undoubtedly would uh, develop other relationships with other people, and uh, whenever you have those type of relationships, family relationships, you have family disagreements, uh, <coughs> the old suspicions, the old disagreements, and maybe this way of settling those matters could reoccur. So the court can find these circumstances are not likely to uh, recur. The fifth finding here that the court is, or the factor is that the offender shows genuine remorse for the offense. And again, the court finds that no remorse uh, has been shown, uh, only denial. Um, and again, the jury did not believe the denial. Uh, the court's also to consider, as I indicated, military service where applicable, and that's not here. So the court's considered all of these factors that the court's required uh, to consider and is, and is ready to uh, impose sentence. So, Mr. Wagner, I'll ask you to stand at this point.
on count one of the indictment for the offense of aggravated murder in violation of section 2903.01a of the revised code, the victim of that offense being Kenneth Roden, the court hereby sentences you to serve a mandatory term of life imprisonment without parole. Upon count two of the indictment, the victim of the offense being Chris Roden Sr. And again, the charge of aggravated murder, and I've given the section number. In fact, all of these first eight offenses involve the crime of aggravated murder set separate victims in violation of 2903.01a of the revised code. So on count two, the victim being Chris Roden, the court will sentence you to serve a mandatory term of life imprisonment without parole. On count three of the indictment, the victim of the offense of aggravated murder being Gary Roden, the court will also sentence you to serve a mandatory term of life imprisonment without parole. On count four of the indictment, for the aggravated murder of Clarence Franklin Roden, the court will sentence you to serve a mandatory term of life imprisonment without parole. On count five of the indictment, the victim of the offense being Hannah Hazel Gilley, the crime being aggravated murder, the court will sentence you to serve a mandatory term of life imprisonment without parole. Upon count six of the indictment, for the aggravated murder of Dana Roden, the court will sentence you to serve a mandatory term of life imprisonment without parole. On count seven of the indictment, for the aggravated murder of Hannah Mae Roden, the court will sentence you to serve a mandatory term of life imprisonment without parole. And on count eight of the indictment, the victim of the offense being Christopher Roden Jr., for the offense of aggravated murder, the court will sentence you to serve a mandatory term of life imprisonment without parole. On count nine of the indictment, the offense there that you were found guilty of is conspiracy, a first degree felony in violation of section 2923.01A1 and A2, and 2923.01J1. The court will sentence you to serve a definite term of eight years in prison. On count 10, for the offense of aggravated burglary, and this is at 1084 Left Fork Road, in violation of section 2911.11A1 and 2911.11A2 and 2911.11B, a felony of the first degree, the court will sentence you to serve a prison term of eight years. On count 11, the charge is aggravated burglary involving the premises at 4119 Union Hill Road. Again, the section numbers are 2911.11A1 and A2 and 2911.11B, a felony of the first degree, the court will sentence you to serve a definite prison term of eight years. On count 12, for the offense of aggravated burglary, the section numbers are the same. This involves the premises at 4077 Union Hill Road, a felony of the first degree, the court will sentence you to serve a prison term of eight years. On count 13, for aggravated burglary at 3122 Union Hill Road, the section numbers, of course, are the same. Felony of the first degree, the court will sentence you to serve a definite prison term of eight years. On count 14, unlawful possession of dangerous ordinance, 2923.17A1 of the revised code, a fifth degree felony, the court will sentence you to serve a prison term of ten months. Count 15, tampering with evidence, this involves phones and cameras, 2921.12A1 and 2921.12B, a felony of the third degree, the court will sentence you to serve a prison term of 24 months. Upon count 16, tampering with evidence involving custody documents, the court will sentence you to serve a prison term of 24 months. The section numbers there are 2921.12A2 and 2921.12B. Again, it's a felony of the third degree. On count 17, for the offense of tampering with evidence, 
involving security, uh, home security system, uh, shell casings, and silencer. Uh, 2921.12A, 2921.12B, the revised code of felony of the third degree, the court will sentence you to serve a definite term of 24 months. On count 18, for the offense of forgery, 2913.31A1 and A2, and 2913.31C1B, that's a felony of the fifth degree, the court will sentence you to serve a prison term of uh, 10 months. Point count 19, an authorized use of property, 2913.04B and 2913.04G2, uh, uh, that's a felony of the fifth degree. The court will sentence you to serve a prison term of 10 months. On count 20, uh, interception of wire, oral, or electronic communications, 2933.52A1 and 29. 33.52C, a felony of the fourth degree, the court will uh, sentence you to uh, serve a prison term of 12 months. On count uh, 21, obstructing justice, 2921.32A4 and, and, and A5 and 2921.32C3, a felony of the fifth degree, the court will sentence you to serve a prison term of 10 months. And upon count 22, engaging in the pattern of corrupt activity, 2923.32A1 and 2923.32B1, that's a felony of the first degree. The court will sentence you to serve a prison term of uh, eight years, and that's a mandatory term pursuant to 29, 2913F. Concerning the firearm specifications, uh, in considering those, um, those specifications, all of which the court, the jury found to be guilty, the court, uh, the, the section 2929.14B1B provides that such mandatory prison terms shall not be reduced pursuant to section 2967.19, that's petition for early release. Section 2929.20, that's judicial release. Section 2967.193, that's early, that's earned days credit, or any other provision of Chapter 2967 or Chapter 5120 of the Revised Code and Statute further provides, or the, the law further provides by the Constitution decree and decision that you not receive jail time credit for. Uh, uh, prison for the prison sentences imposed for the firearm specifications. Uh, and finally, prison terms imposed for firearm specifications are to run consecutively to and are, be uh, are to be served consecutively uh, to each other and consecutively to and prior to <coughs> prison terms imposed for the underlying offenses. The court uh, is aware that 2929. 2929.14B1B uh, 2929 B1B provides that except as provided in B1G of the section, the court shall not impose more than one prison term on any offender uh, under B1A <coughs> for felonies committed as part of the same act or transaction. Now there's an exception stated in 2929.14 B1G. And that exception is that if the offender is convicted of or pleads guilty to two or more felonies, if one or more of those felonies are aggravated murder, <coughs> murder uh, attempted aggravated murder, attempted murder, aggravated robbery, felonious assault, or rape, and if the offender is convicted or pleads guilty to a firearm specification in connection with two or more of the felonies, the sentencing court shall impose on the offender the prison term specified for the two most serious specifications of which the offender is convicted or to which the offender pleads guilty and in its discretion may also impose on the offender the prison term as specified for any or all of the remaining firearm specifications. Now based upon the way in which the Ohio Supreme Court has defined in case law same act or transaction, this court finds that the eight aggravated murders charged in counts 
uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 do not constitute the same act or transaction with different victims involved in all of those uh, as one of those, the reasons why, but I'm, I'm finding that they're not the same act or transaction. And the court will therefore impose a mandatory prison term upon uh, uh, one of the specifications stated for, or for which you've been found guilty with respect to each of those counts, and I'll get into that here in a minute, uh, and for each of those eight counts of the indictment. The court further finds that although for the purposes of sentencing, in this case, on the specifications, on the firearm specifications, the aggravated burglary charged in count 10 may constitute the same act or transaction as the aggravated murder charge in count one, which may be the same act or transaction, that the aggravated burglary charged in count 11 may constitute the same act or transaction as aggravated murder charge in count four and the aggravated murder charge in count five, based upon the victims in that evidence, and the aggravated burglary charge in count 12 may constitute the same act or transaction as the aggravated murder charge in count two and the aggravated murder charge in count three, and that the aggravated burglary charge in count 13 may constitute the same act or transaction as the aggravated murder charge in count six, the aggravated murder charge in count seven, and the aggravated murder charge in count eight. Pursuant to section 2929.14b1g, the court shall impose a sentence on the most serious firearm specifications of which the defendant was convicted as to count 10, count 11, count 12, and count 13 as well. Therefore, uh, on as to specification three to count one, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of six years. As to specification three to count two, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of six years. As to specification three to count three, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of six years. As to specification three to count four, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of six years. As to specification three to count five, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of six years. As to specification three to count six, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of six years. As to specification three to count seven, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of six years. As to specification three to count eight, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of six years. As to specification three to count 10, uh, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of six years. As to specification three to count 11, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of six years. As to specification three to count 12, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of six years. As to specification three to count 13, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of six years. As to specification two to count 14, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of three years, and as to count, as to specification three to count 22, the court imposes a mandatory prison term of six years, resulting in a total of mandatory prison terms of 81 years for those firearm specifications, uh, which are to be served consecutively to each other and consecutively to and prior to the prison terms imposed for the underlying uh, felonies, and also those prison terms of 81 years are not to be reduced uh, pursuant uh, to any sections of law, uh, and are um, and there's, there's no jail time credit for those uh, on those. The court also finds that consecutive service of the prison terms imposed in this case is necessary to protect the public from future crime and to publish uh, and to punish, excuse me, and to punish the defendant and that consecutive sentences are not disproportionate to the seriousness of the defendant's conduct and to the danger the defendant poses to the public. The court further finds that the defendant committed the offenses of which he has been found guilty in this action as part of one or more courses of conduct and the harm caused by all of the offenses so committed was so great and unusual 
that no single prison term for any of the offenses committed as part of any of the courses of conduct adequately reflects the seriousness of the defendant's conduct. The court also finds that the defendant's history of criminal conduct, although, uh, uh, as we mentioned, un undetected uh, and, and unprosecuted, but, uh, but referred to by the defendant in his own testimony and also in the testimony of several things, the defendant's history of criminal conduct demonstrates that consecutive sentences are necessary to protect the public from future crime by the offender. <coughs> the court therefore orders that the prison terms of life imprisonment without parole imposed in counts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 shall be served consecutively to each other um, and consecutive to the prison terms in, uh, imposed for the 14 firearm specification. The eight-year prison terms imposed in counts 10, 11, 12, 13, and 22 shall be served consecutively to each other and consecutively to the prison terms imposed in counts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 and consecutive to the prison terms imposed on the 14 firearm specifications. The prison terms imposed in counts 9, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21 shall be served concurrently with each other and concurrently with the prison terms imposed in, uh, in counts uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 22. The aggregate of, of this sentence is eight consecutive terms of life imprisonment without parole plus 121 years, 81 years of which are mandatory and shall be served prior to the prison terms imposed for the underlying felonies cannot be reduced uh, pursuant to law and uh, for which there is no jail time credit. The eight years imposed on count 22 also is a mandatory term. <coughs> now, uh, the law provides that upon the defendant serving the prison terms, the definite prison terms, and non-life prison terms imposed in counts 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 22. Those are all first degree felonies. If he is released from prison upon the serving those terms in full, the law provides that he would be released on, on uh, post-release control for a mandatory period of five years for each of those offenses uh, and would be supervised by the adult parole authority. And upon the defendant serving the prison terms imposed for the felonies in counts 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, if he's released from prison upon serving those prison terms in full, it may be, he may be released on, upon optional post-release control for a period of up to two years if the parole board finds that his release on post-release control is necessary for him. Now, I'm, I'm going to advise him of the post-release control, although, of course, the, override, the overriding sentences of life with, uh, left imprisonment without parole on the first eight counts uh, would make this advisement uh, uh, somewhat uh, maybe uh, unnecessary, but the law does provide that I'm to advise him of this, so I'm going to either complete the sentencing uh, of this defendant. PRC, of course, does not apply to counts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. But if he is released uh, on PRC, on, uh, if he violates any of the terms, I should say, of PRC, post-release control, the parole board provides that the parole, uh, the, the law provides that the parole board may return the defendant to prison for up to nine months for each violation. However, <coughs> the, the total aggregate period for which the defendant can be returned to prison by the parole board for all violations of post-release control cannot exceed one half of the prison term imposed by the court. 
if the defendant commits a new felony while on post-release control, then any court that sentences him on that new felony, in addition to imposing a prison term for the new felony, may impose an additional prison term for the violation of post-release control. And the maximum period of that additional prison term is one year, or the time he has remaining on his post-release control period, whichever is greater. And any prison term imposed for the violation of post-release control would be imposed consecutively to any prison term imposed for the new felony committed while on post-release control. Again, that would apply only if the defendant is released from prison, it's my understanding, and on counts one through eight, he is not to be released from prison. Now, the defendant obviously has been convicted of felony offenses of violence. Therefore, the defendant may not acquire, have, carry, or use any firearm or dangerous ordinance for the rest of his life unless he's relieved of that disability by a court of competent jurisdiction. If he does have, use, carry, or acquire a firearm or dangerous ordinance in violation of that restriction, that would constitute having weapons while under disability, a felony of the third degree. The court will not impose a fine on any of these offenses. However, the court does order that the court costs be assessed to the defendant as part of the sentence. If the costs aren't paid in a timely manner or pursuant to any schedule that this court may approve or the court may establish, the court can order court costs satisfied through community service work. If the court were to issue that type order, the defendant would receive credit toward the court costs in an amount that we would compute by multiplying the number of community service hours worked by a specific rate per hour that the court would set at the time the order is made. And every hour worked on community service pursuant to that order would reduce the court cost balance in the amount of that hourly rate. You do have the right, Mr. Wagner, to appeal the judgment and sentence of the court. If you do not afford the cost of an appeal, you have the right to appeal without cost. If you do not afford an attorney or cannot obtain an attorney to assist you with your appeal, you have the right to have an attorney appointed for that purpose at no cost to yourself. It's my understanding you've already filed a motion requesting that, and the court will be looking at the motion and trying to, well, and appointing you an attorney, I'm sure. If you cannot afford the documents necessary for an appeal, you have the right to have those documents provided at no cost to yourself, and you have the right to have a timely notice of appeal filed on your behalf. Now, on behalf of the state, are there any additions or corrections or anything that you wish to say with regard to the sentence just imposed? No, Your Honor. On behalf of the defense, is there anything further with regard to sentencing that you wish to bring up, either matters of correction or addition? Just note our objection, Your Honor, to the maximum sentence, consecutive sentences, to the denial of credit for time served and the violation of due process, and also to the court imposing costs. Your Honor, just one thing on that. I think the jail time credit is 1,492 days. I realize that does not get attributed to the firearm specifications, but it certainly would to— He doesn't receive it on the firearm specifications. I'm glad you mentioned that. Do you have the number of days there? 1,492. 1,492, I believe. I did that by, you know, four years. The court will, on the offenses for which jail time credit is permitted, which would not include the sentences imposed for the firearm specifications, the court will, the defendant will receive credit, jail time credit, toward those other sentences. And the amount is, does the defense feel that's a problem? Yeah, it's from the date of his arrest. For all days spent in jail from the time of his arrest through today's date, he will receive credit. And then, of course, if he's held until he's transported to the state correction facility to begin serving for his prison terms, he will receive credit for that time. Thank you, Judge. And just to be clear, we object to the statute that denies him credit for time served. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Wagner.
What's that again? We object to the statute that denies it credit. For the, for the, uh, just to be clear. All right. Thank you, Judge. Yeah. Anything further? If not, then we are adjourned. Thank you, Your Honor. homicide in Columbus, right? Yeah, it was great work. You too, buddy. Best